Hey everybody, how's it going? Mohammed Sheikh here. So this is a really interesting episode. Um, that's funny. I'm saying episode like I've got a you know TV series or something like that. So I don't really know where that came from. Sure. But <laughs> maybe that's a sign. Maybe I need to have something more regular. Um, but I wanted to really record this for a number of reasons. Uh, one, it's specifically I wanted to have this uh, this conversation with my friend Dale Solomon. I'm going to get into a little bit about who he is and you know why we're listening to him. Um, uh, for a client of mine, because just synchronicities as it lines up. Uh, so there's that reason. And but the second reason is more just about I think I think the story that he's going to share with us and in the very many yet brief conversations I've had, like I've only known Dale for about a week, I think. Is that right, Dale? Yes, uh, UPW ended last week for Pete's sakes. Yeah, and we've already connected so much and I've already gotten a lot of richness. And, you know, things that I can take into my own life um, about just how I'm showing up and how I'm living. So, you know, there's a specific conversation to be had, but I think there's a general conversation to be had just about how are we living life. So um, I'm going to let Dale introduce himself and sort of his background. Uh, and then I'll kind of get specific into why I connected with Dale to begin with. Although, as you and I are talking, we realize we have so much in common and we're probably going to have more than this conversation, right down to the fact that how come you and I have the same Lego model, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, so, Dale, tell us a little bit about kind of like your background, yourself, and, um, you know, let's start there. So uh, currently, I'm a 53-year-old. I live in Tampa, Florida. I practice as an oral and maxillofacial surgeon, which is a uh, fancy doctor speak for I pull out people's teeth. I um, have found that I have had many hobbies in my lifetime, but uh, during the last three years of my life, I found a significant more amount of leverage to keep me invested in them. Uh, this leverage comes from a uh, little brush with death. I have a five-year-old and a uh, two-year-old child. Around the time that my um, first child was coming around, I noticed that I was getting more and more tired. And I had been a guy in the past that had run uh, almost every day of my life and, until I had a back injury. And swam a mile in the pool almost every day until uh, about five or six years ago. And I found I was doing less and less and I blamed it a little bit on having a child, but I went to the doctor's office for an exam. You know, although I had told my wife, I see a doctor every day. When I look in the mirror, I actually went to see somebody else who then told me, Oh, you have a heart murmur. And after she told me that I had a heart murmur, she then said, let's get you to go see a cardiologist. And after getting a sonogram at the cardiologist, I realized I had a problem with uh, one of my valves uh, while getting the exam. Um, and then I met with the cardiologist who told me that I was born with a congenital heart defect, which absolutely took me by surprise because I'd listened to my heart many times. And I actually had worked as a heart lung technician in college inventing um, uh, with, a, with a very famous doctor, uh, a Dr. Bartlett at Michigan that invented the ECMO machine. I, I worked in cardiac research. I even at one point thought I was going to be a pediatric uh, cardiothoracic surgeon. To find out that I had a congenital heart defect was something that it, it took me a little while to swallow. And of course, I went through the stages of grief. Um, anger, and uh, I made okay with it finally. And after about uh, a year, I met with the surgeon who told me that he wanted to put a mechanical valve into my heart, which uh, I can't even deal with the clicking sound of a ceiling fan and was well aware that many patients complain about the sound in their chest of the mechanical valve, as well as I did not want to be on Coumadin as a surgeon, having a blood thinner and uh, working with a scalpel didn't seem like a great idea for me. So I did a lot of research and found a fellow that gave me the most expensive piece of cow that a person could own. And I have a cow valve uh, for my bicuspid aortic valve inside of my chest. After 
I went through the surgery immediately, some things changed. I had a lot more time on my hand for about six months. So I took to the computer and started finding ways to make my diet better because for Pete's sakes, if my arteries were going to wind up being clogged and I went through having my chest cracked open, then it wasn't going to last very long. And the biological valve has about a 15 year shelf life. So I wanted to be as healthy as possible. I um, started to uh, lose weight and went from uh, about 225 pounds before the surgery down to 184 pounds where I've sat anywhere from about 182 to 186 pounds ever since the surgery. Although in the past I've weighed more and I've done other diets, I'm on something that's not really a diet. It's more of a lifestyle change. Um, I, I don't eat processed foods or sugars other than dark chocolate. And I, I found that the fear of having my life messed with and having to go through this again really was a lot more important to me than being the foodie that I had once been uh, traveling to France, traveling to um, Prague, traveling to Montreal, traveling to California, to San Francisco and eating my way through cities. Uh, my wife and I had to find that uh, long walks and uh, other activities would be the focus of the trip. Um, even the cruise ships where I'd eat my way through the cruise had to be changed into uh, longer relaxation periods. And um, I, I quit smoking, the, had my last cigarette the day before the surgery. Um, right after the surgery, I found I was dealing with uh, quite a bit of anger. Uh, I had a very short fuse. I don't know if it was maybe not enough attention from my peers or from my uh, uh, people that I worked with or from family, uh, you know, going through the end of your life and wondering, you know, how significant you are can really put a, a little tamper on how happy you might wind up being. But I found that uh, before going in for the surgery, I had said to the, the infinite spirit, if you let me stick around, I promise that everything that I endeavored to do, I'll do to more of a full extent. Um, some examples, I played the piano as a kid and stopped playing somewhere around college when there was no more piano available. And, and every once in a while, I'd play on my piano in the house, but I really couldn't play a full song. And I started spending about a half an hour a day or at least an hour of total a week learning a new song so that maybe every three months I've picked up a new song since the surgery. Um, recently learned how to play a song that I thought was so beyond my wheelhouse that I, I, I still play it and wonder how my fingers are moving as fast as they're going. I liken it to the Irish cloggers and their feet looking like they're going to fly off because they move so fast. Um, playing Claire de Lune uh, by Debussy it has been uh, my supreme achievement on the piano. Wow. Uh, and I also went back to... Uh, learning how to speak Russian because my wife is Russian and had some vocabulary words, but uh, my son started speaking more and more fluently. And I have now spent uh, 900 days. So even before the surgery on uh, the application Duolingo, but uh, more so I picked up uh, the speak um, Pimsler courses and I've gone through those. And when I started speaking Russian more and more conversational, the Spanish that I used to know started to disappear and I speak with my patients frequently in Spanish and Russian words were coming out. So I now spend time every day studying Russian and Spanish. And then I made this deal with a big man upstairs or a big woman upstairs. And I actually started speaking French again too. So every morning when I wake up uh, around uh, 5.30 in the morning, uh, six o'clock in the morning, I go through about uh, 12 to 18 different exercises of about 20 sentences a piece on the Duolingo app and on the uh, Babbel app. And I get my Spanish, my French, and my Russian going. And when I commute to work, when I don't have the coronavirus uh, in the background, I actually listen to the Pimsler tapes for one of the languages on the way to work and on the way home from work so that I can get that going. Um, as well as lately, I um, take in about a book a day or at least a book every two days 
uh, consistently now for about a month. I've been keeping up this, uh, and I am studying uh, neurolinguistic programming, uh, hypnotherapy, um, uh, how to astral project, which I have not sex, uh, successfully done, and lucid dreaming, which I've now done successfully twice since I've started to look at them. I took up meditation and I took up yoga again. Mm -hmm. So um, really, I'm a very busy father and uh, stay at home right now other than one day a week. But uh, I fill my brain every chance that I get. It seems to be uh, that's the only thing that I can assure myself. And it's strange. What makes me feel like I'm happy is actually the progressive growth in my life. If I sat down at the piano every day and I found that I couldn't play the song or remember a piece of the song, I'd become discouraged very quickly. But that's not the way it goes when you consistently put marbles in the top of the funnel. Things come out the bottom. Mm. It, the more effort that you make in the language, the more comfortable you get, the faster you go through the applications and the more easily you speak to the patients when they sit down in a chair or your friend that thinks that they speak Spanish fluently or you know, your conversations with an ex-girlfriend maybe that uh, spoke French and told you that you couldn't speak French well, go more smoothly. Uh, this being said, remember if you're not growing, then you're not living anyhow. So whatever it is, use the leverage and the fear that you've had to go through to wind up pushing you forward to make these days worthwhile instead of focusing on oh why me think wow i get this chance again thank god for me and, and this has been the way i've dealt with the situation i hope it helps yeah I'm we're gonna go yeah, we're, we're gonna go uh deeper into this because you know for so so first of all i know you mentioned a few of the tools and the apps and uh one of the things for those of you watching um is uh, I'll, I'll sit down with dale to make sure I actually get links or whatever he mentions, right? And you know, I'll make sure to include it in the comments and everything. Um, but you know, it, I do a lot of things in in, in many ways. Like, uh, you know, uh, for those of you that's been following my work, um, you know, yes, I'm a hypnotist. Yes, I'm an NLP guy. Yes, I'm a trainer with HeartMath Institute. But you know, it all comes down to really answering this question that's always been burning. You know, and kind of. Uh, pushing me forward is, you know, why is it that the same life event can happen to two different people? And for one person, it, you know, is the thing that puts them in a downward spiral. And for another person, it's the thing that becomes the catalyst to this transformation. And I always joke, it's the thing that turns them into a TED talk, like maybe 20 years later or 30 years later uh, in their life. And I, I really believe that, you know, God connected me with you because, you know, right now I've got a client that I, you know, I've been seeing on and off since, uh, since about, I think Feb was when I first, first met him. And it's a pretty rare thing, right, to, to have what you have. Um, and out of the, the billions of people in the world, you know, we are attending this, you know, Tony Robbins virtual event. I'm here in Toronto, you're in Florida. And, you know, out of the 20,000 people that sign up for the program, <laughs> you end up being in the same room as I am. And you just casually happen to say, oh, you know, I had this, you know, this, this heart defect and it, it, you had to get a valve replaced. And I see that in the chat and I'm like, oh, my God. Right. This is exactly what my client is going through right now. And from the, you know, your chat and your language, it was quite evident that you're the individual that used it to become the catalyst for transformation in an upwards momentum, as opposed to, you know, the thing that puts you in a downward spiral. Um, so really, I guess, in simple things is like, how did you do that? Right? What did you say to yourself? How come you didn't? Let me start asking this question, because you know, if I kind of go back, you had a lot of this anger, um, but when you first learned about it, how come you didn't go into you know the internet and start looking up of all the ways your life's going to be messed up, or did you? <laughs> well, uh, of course, I was in denial at first. Oh no, this is impossible. It turns out it's not so rare. 
it's the most common heart defect that exists. It's about one out of a hundred people. Now, oh, okay. I've even met people that have lived until their 80th birthday. I've been at a dinner conversation with a person that has a bicuspid aortic valve that has not been operated on. So some people will go through their life with this defect and won't have it even worse. What really freaked me out was that one out of 10 of my progeny are supposed to have this males more likely than females. And I have two male boys who have both been tested and thank God they have been found to have normal bicuspid or uh, tricuspid valves inside their heart. Look like a little Mercedes Benz symbol. Um, I, I have to say, I don't like the idea of having medicines, et cetera. And when the doctor told me about the mechanical valve, I had already studied and learned everything that I could about it. And I have a brother-in-law that's actually a cardiothoracic surgeon that I would not trust to open me up, unfortunately. But he told me a lot of the information. He said, oh, Dale, it's just a routine surgery. And I, I look at him and say, when I take out your tooth, it's a routine surgery. And I still feel bad that you're losing a tooth. When you're having your chest cracked open, that's a different story. Um, even stranger, when I went to California, I met with a cardio uh, cardiologist there who said, oh, Dale, you can pay me $150,000. I'll do the TAVI, the uh, transvenous catheter uh, approach to your heart, and we'll pop something in there too, but then you'll be on Coumadin. And it was at that time only for high-risk patients, and I am not a guinea pig, so I didn't want to have something that wasn't tried and true at the time. But um, I, I knew that here I was with this situation, and I'm the type of person when I'm confronted with an obstacle, I like to tackle it. Uh, for example, having medicines thrown at me was something that I was really furious about. And as my diet started working for me and my blood pressure went down and I was able to tell the, the cardiologist and the medical doctor, oh, I, I don't need my blood pressure any medicine anymore. It was a victory. So there was a lot of victories that were coming even before the surgery and having lifestyle changes. And you no, know, um, I couldn't say I'm not going to do this surgery, although I, I feel at 53, I've lived a very full life. I, I'm okay if I have to go or if it's my time. I have the children and my wife that I wanted to live for. So maybe that was part of the way that my eyes were opened and I didn't wind up saying, oh, why me? How this happened to me? Um, I've I've also not had the perfectly easy life. I have a father that was a crack cocaine addict and he wound up uh, overdosing on his uh, drug of choice um, uh, many years back. And I've had turns of financial uh, success and uh, poverty in my lifetime where we started out in a poor neighborhood, uh, moved to a fancy neighborhood. Father lost his business and snorted it up his nose and uh, then we were poor again, and mom remarried, then we were wealthy again, and of course, then I was a college student eating ramen noodles, which uh, is not really food, but uh, I was eating it anyhow. So I, I'd say obstacles, again, are something that I'm used to when you put them in front of me, are things that I try to find a way around, jump over, kick over, blow up, etc. So I wasn't going to let this heart surgery be another one of them. Uh, What's your then, relationship with obstacles? You know, when something bad happens to you, when something challenging happens to you, what meaning do you ascribe to it? I, I'm a survivor. I, I, I say that my value system of being a survivor winds up letting behaviors and habits wind up being things that I can kick aside. The, the, the hierarchy in my mind winds up having you will survive be the mantra or the, the thought process that's in my head that winds up saying, look, if I'm here today, I'm surviving. If I'm dead, I'm not surviving. I'm clearly here, so I'm a survivor. By saying that, an obstacle winds up being something that I can move around clearly. It's kind of like when uh, you think about the people that are smokers, they say, oh, I really want to quit, but I'm a smoker. Mm -hmm. The statement, I'm a smoker, winds up being why they're a smoker. If they change it from being, I'm a smoker until I'm not a smoker, well, then they're no longer a smoker, and the behavior falls away really easily. It's it's the same thing with an obstacle. I think that, uh, like playing with Legos and building the model, you have the plans in front of you, you have a start, you have a finish, 
when something's thrown in front of you, you have to do it. And even like getting through school, I always said to people, I, I do well at school because if somebody gives me a curriculum and they put it in front of me and tell me what I have to do, and I know what grades I have to get for them, well, that's an obstacle that was put in front of me. And there's a clear recipe on how to do it, follow the recipe and turn it through and you do it. If there wasn't at, at the time when I was going through school, a curriculum, I probably wouldn't have made it anywhere because there'd have been nothing for me to follow to get over those. So although in life, I now create my own obstacles or my own challenges. I, I say very clearly what it is that I want to do, whether it's play this song or speak this language. And I put that challenge in front of me. And that's how I start to wind up filling in the little boxes to move forward to get them through. Does that explain it well? Yeah, no, it, it does. And I mean, I, I'm also getting a sense of, you know, you're very aware of the importance of your language that you use and how the language you use, especially the I am statements. Yeah. Right. How they Chance create. Is not a word. Chance <laughs> is not a word unless it's something that my wife wants me to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing you and I have in common. Um, I mean, I'm so hyper vigilant about my self dialogue and my I am statements to the point that I recognize that even, you know, because I, I hear it in people's language all the time because of, you know, the, the, the nature of the work that I do. Uh, and people will say things about themselves in passing like it's no big deal, like, oh, you know what? Oh, I'm too lazy for this, or I'm too tired, or, you know, um, I'm, just, I'm a procrastinator, or I'm this, or I'm that. And it's, it's like, hey, you're programming yourself with that. But I'm to the point where I recognize that because, because I understand that all beliefs are one, not real, and the byproduct of all beliefs are, it comes with a set of permissions and a set of restrictions. That's all beliefs do. And so it's really important to choose the beliefs that are going to serve you and most people uh, have never actually chosen their beliefs most people are still operating on the beliefs that were given to them when they were a kid through you know their parents their teachers society their friends and no one's you know most people don't actually choose their beliefs and so because i understand those permissions and restrictions i'm like so hyper vigilant that even saying something like i'm a visual learner which is not a good thing or a bad thing, you know, uh, is it's just a change from modalities. Well, exactly. And I understand that by me making that statement with such congruence and such confidence, then I am actually preventing myself from learning uh, through auditory. And I'm preventing myself from learning kinesthetically because, <laughs> hey, I'm a visual learner. Therefore, that's the only way I learn. Whereas that might be a preferred, that might be a strength. But I've proven <laughs> over the years that I can, I've actually developed my auditory and I've developed my kinesthetic, right? And actually, uh, my sense of smell um, has really increased too, right? Which is that, that's classic kinesthetic it. learning. The synesthesias learn with their smells or with colors while they're playing music and they learn so much faster. The more senses you incorporate, the faster you learn. And you remind me of the Eric's and uh, the voice goes with me or my voice goes with you uh, book. He was talking about the um, shot putter and explaining to this little fellow that was uh, maybe 280 pounds in high school that he could win a record with a shot put. But he says, oh, well, you know, nobody's ever thrown it further than this. So he says, well, you know, any even small improvement that you wind up having is an improvement, he says. I think that at your age, you can be able to do this. And then the boy goes out and does exactly that. And then he goes to the Olympics and he says, well, you're really young. Um, you know, I don't know that you want to compete for the gold or the silver with these seasoned people out there. And he gives them another zone to work for and he, he makes it. And then finally he goes back four years later and he is now the world record holder for shot put. The restrictions that were in his mind for how long a person could go were the restrictions that stopped them from moving forward or the uh, mile runner who just tried to say, well, it's only a second between, you know, being at four minutes or being below four minutes. And then he broke the record just by taking that limitation away from his mind. Yeah. I've been told a billion times that 
an American person can't speak Russian or an adult can't speak Russian or learn languages, but yet sometimes we'll go to a restaurant and the, the waitress or waiter will be Russian and I'll speak Russian to them and they'll ask me where I'm from. <laughs> Assuming again that I'm not an American because I've been able to mimic the accent now at this point well enough. Granted, I have the luxury of being immersed in Russian when my children speak it, my wife speaks it, and the cartoons are playing in my house in Russian, which uh, helps a ton. Yeah, it, you need to have all your all your senses involved with the language. The kids' books that I try to read all the time to the baby in Russian, etc. You, you need all these faculties, and, and it's strange too that you say you know I'm a, a visual learner. I am definitely heavy in my visual um, learning. I, I prefer notes that come in the form of something that is colorful, uh, a mind map like Tony Bazan winds up discussing versus uh, notes that are handwritten out or scrawled out on a piece of page. I, I seem to learn better about it, but I realized immediately when I'm trying to study language that I didn't do great in French because all I did was read it in a book. I wasn't going to the language lab. Just being visual without being auditory didn't help nearly as well as when I took an intensive Spanish class in college where we had to sat, sit down and speak it. So when you get the different systems, it actually helps you pick things up much more quickly than when you're limited to one. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Now, the more senses we can engage, you know, the more parts of the brain that we're engaging, we're just adding more firepower and more resources uh, to that same task. And you know, kind of bringing this conversation back to the concept of beliefs, you know, I'm also glad that you, you use the word recipes, like you were following a very different recipe. And part of the ingredients of the recipe was that identity statement that you made about I am a survivor, that's how you viewed yourself, you have, uh, you have a certain perspective on obstacles that hey, you know, it's something for here that I'm going to get through. Let me ask you this question, if you were to teach me or if you were to write the recipe on how to go on a downward spiral, which is what you didn't do, but if you were to, <laughs> what would be the ingredients? What would be the steps of that recipe? You know, you're giving this news. What would you have to do in order to go to uh, in a downward spiral? I, I've been on downward spiral before, so it's an easy recipe to wind up explaining. Okay. I was uh, once in medical school and my focus was on dating versus on studying um, the medical school curriculum. Ignore what it is that you know you have to do and you will immediately go on a downward spiral. I, I didn't like the neighborhood that the school was in. I wasn't really invested. I wasn't sure what my direction was going to be. So lose your direction and stop checking the boxes off and you will spiral downwards. Um, sometimes it takes getting kicked in the pants and feeling like you can't move forward to wind up succeeding. Um, as a freshman in college, I went through the same thing that I'm talking about in medical school. I found again that there was a lot of dating to be done and I had been at a boarding school where there wasn't a lot of dating to be done. So I was focused not on school, but on having fun and got a 2.31 term. And at that point, my parents said to me, well, now you'll never get into medical school. And I was surprised. They didn't tell me that they were disappointed or whatnot. They said, it's your life. You live your life whatever way you need to. And at that point, survivor mode kicked in and I started working on checking the boxes off. I didn't get anything less than an A minus again in school after I wound up realizing I was doing it for myself. Mm. Uh, once I was given the option again in medical school that I could repeat biochemistry, I was also given the option to transfer to dental school and, uh, and start my new career, which I chose to do at a better school. And then I did phenomenal in school where I graduated in the top 10% of the class. The, the difference is again, Sometimes you think you know what your goal is and that goal is not the right one to achieve or your goal isn't what you say your goal is. So again, be distracted and uh, do something different than what you know you have to do. You will go in a downward spiral. Yeah, no, absolutely. What I'm also hearing in that is the importance of, in a way, knowing what you want. Having what you want 
seem like it's further away from you sometimes too, makes you work harder to pull it back in. Um, as a uh, surgical resident in my internship, I contracted a, a rare uh, bacteria called a mycobacterium, either um, making sushi or uh, swimming in the, the local lake. I wound up with a cyst or something that looked like a cyst in the back of my hand. And then I went through multiple surgeries on the back of my hand where I was no longer able to play the piano, paint. Uh, I wasn't able to operate anymore for months and months. And instead of, again, feeling bad for myself, it was something that helped me propel myself through my residency, knowing, wow, I get this chance again to be here and to use my hand. Let's make the best of it. And again, I didn't start playing piano at that time. At that time, I started painting uh, pop art canvases. There's splashes of color around my room here and there that you might see. Mm. But uh, I paint large pop art canvases when I was a resident, working 120 hours a week. I'd still come home and I'd paint because here I had the use of my hand. I was going to make the best of it. So again, sometimes that uh, feeling like it can't possibly get any worse is when you're propelled the most into running. Like the further it is away, the more it actually pulls you back. Um, Tony Robbins did that visual exercise with us where he pulled it away from us. And you know, once you can taste it and it gets pulled away from you, sometimes that will be the antithesis of the question that you're asking. So. Maybe if it's really close up to you and uh, it seems like it's really easy or it can be really easy, then you'll find that you can go in a downward spiral. Let's say somebody's enabling you at the same time mm. to wind up feeling bad about yourself or not to learn anything new or not to have to earn any money. Well, then that's probably the keys to the recipe that allow it. It's right there. So then you don't have to try to work so hard to wind up reaching for it. Can you add yeah. anything to that? Yeah, okay. I'm also kind of curious in, you know, you mentioned that, you know, perhaps it was, you know, your, um, the fact, you know, your family, your wife and your son, and that was a reason to really, um, to really live for. But there, there there's, I, I feel there's, you know, if you go a little bit deeper into the beliefs, I guess I'm just really curious about what was that belief around, because you could feel sorry for yourself. You could get into the anger. You could get into the why me. I did it again. My wife said I had the shortest fuse that she's ever seen on a person. And that probably went that way for, oh, maybe two or three months after the surgery until I went back to work and started to feel more empowered. And, um, uh, stranger, after that, I, I wound up starting to look into meditation and uh, I, I found about the heart math uh, information and I found uh, David Wilcox who talks about uh, maybe some woo-woo sort of stuff that, uh, that if you're not uh, at least 51% more for other people than you are for yourself, then chances are that you're going to repeat the same existence with your karma. Uh, I learned about forgiving, et cetera, which all, again, makes me uh, happier and healthier than I think I ever was prior to the surgery. Uh, Can I, you expand on that statement about if you're not 51% at least around other people than you are for yourself? I mean, just, just sort of speak on that. I mean, I, mean, I, I know what you mean, but but, you know, for everyone else. <laughs> well, the, the world has two different types of people. There's people that take and there's people that give. And you see this in interaction all the time. You have your one friend that likes to complain and your other friend that likes to soothe. You have the, uh, the caretakers around the house and you have the caregivers that are around the house. Mm. And if you spend most of your time about your own world and about me, me, me versus having a life that's focused on giving back, A, you probably won't feel as good as you do, but B, you start to wind up weighing the karma onto you, the, the weights, the ropes of what you're indentured to other people. And truly, the idea of being a giving person frees you from 
uh, the, you can bring in all the energy and all the light and all the spirit that you want to into your body. And that'll weigh on you too if you're not trying to share it with other people. I, I always uh, have understood this intuitively. It's why I went into the medical profession in the first place. Uh, or even as a kid, you know, you learn something, you want to teach it to somebody else. So you learn how to swim, you want to be a swim instructor or a lifeguard or this sort of thing. It's just, to me, it seems natural, but when somebody starts explaining it to me that if you don't wind up fulfilling this purpose during this lifetime, then you have to come back and repeat it again versus uh, they talk about moving on to a different density of spirit or getting closer to the source. Uh, although I don't mind our existence as human beings, there's a uh, a lot of poor things in this model, like being able to be born with a heart defect. Again, realizing how absolutely insane it is that we can comprehend ourselves in the first place and that all of our comprehensions of ourselves come from our senses. Obviously, we're this energy that, that can't wind up being held into a body or you know that comes from the stars, et cetera. Our whole purpose would be completely lonely and uh, in our selfishness, if we didn't understand that you mm -hmm. must spend a larger percentage for others than for yourself. Did, did that help? Yeah, absolutely. Right. And I mean, kind of like a follow up question to that is I'm also curious on. I think there's an element. So there's two statements I want to make. One, I think there's an element of folks that have convinced themselves that they actually are in the service of others but they're not, right? And I've seen this with um, just, you know, I mean, nothing, no, no one or nothing in particular popping into my mind, but, you know, ever since I was a young kid, I've always been in volunteering in one organization or another, right? And I've seen, you know, in certain organizations, it really is about the work they do. And certain organizations, it's really about the, uh, oh, look at me, look at the amazing work I'm doing. I oh, am. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so that's the thing where I, I think, I, I, I think when you sort of pay attention, um, where the focus is will come, because we might, we might be tricking ourselves, we might be lying to ourselves. And it's really hard to see that when we're in it, because, you know, sometimes we need someone else to tell us, sometimes someone needs to hold that mirror in front of us to kind of make us realize that even like the good work that we're doing for others is really, you know, our desire for significance or our desire for control or something. Right. And that, that becomes, that becomes the thing that really falls when we get hit with a challenge because it's like, why me? I'm such this good person. And if we believe and we understand, and this is the sort of stuff that I don't really think gets, properly taught in school is if we understand that one we're spiritual beings having a human experience and behind everything that's thrown at us is a is actually a lesson a test it's a test absolutely right um you know the happiest i've ever been in my life was during a time where i just looked at everything you know like that was my opinion and i kind of forgot that uh for a while in the middle but I remember about 20 years ago, I wrote this little poem, and I don't remember the words anymore, but it was basically saying that, you know, life is a series of tests, and each test is going to get continuously repeated until you learn. <laughs> and then when you learn, you're going to be thrown another test, <laughs> because that's how we grow, <laughs> right? Uh, but what, I, I think when we, so this is not, I guess, really a question more than just, um, you know, just kind of speaking to what you're sharing. Um, I remember reading on uh, on a friend's Facebook post, she made this comment, it was really interesting. She said, you know, you said there's two types of people, which I'll agree with you 100%. And she said, there's, um, you're either a wolf, a shepherd, or a sheep and that's it right and that that for me is like you know i tried that model on and i viewed at the world and I, you know that real things that you know i i think i think depending on context we can be all three and right? all three are necessary too 
Yeah. You know, there is no yin without a yang. Yeah. And you couldn't learn these lessons if there wasn't takers and givers. If there wasn't that balance anyhow, it, it wouldn't make sense. Yeah, absolutely. And it's about, I, I, think, I think the goal is recognizing when we're being a wolf, and, you know, maybe we need to be a sheep, but sheep for a shepherd, you know, and recognizing that the goal of being a shepherd is to turn, you know, others into their own shepherds or something. I don't really know, but it was a really interesting thing. Uh, and you'll see it. You'll really see when people are calling to themselves or when people are really calling to that collective we. Yeah. Okay. So... Where, where, what's your, I mean, like, what drives you forward today now? Because this, this whole incident happened, what, three years ago for you? Three years ago. Three years ago. Okay. So wh well, where are things today for you? Well, actually, I, <laughs> I worked for a corporation for a long period of time. And right prior to the surgery, I started working with a private oral surgeon that has uh, four other oral surgeons working with him. And uh, after my surgery, he said to me one day that he needed to pay me less money, that his accountant told him that uh, I was earning too much. Uh, although I was producing uh, good money for him, it was already in the back of my head that I was going to leave from this place and open up my own business. So I'm actually waiting for my permits to be okayed and for my loan to be approved to start my own practice where I'm going to model what the fellow that I work for was doing maybe a little bit more ethically uh, as far as uh, not telling employees that the accountant winds up deciding what they're paid because we know he decides, but uh, I'm opening up my own practice. And again, this is at 53. In fact, I met Mohammed because I was trying to make myself see business through a better light. I have actually discovered one of my limiting beliefs was I've said, I'm a doctor. I treat patients. I'm not a businessman because I'm a doctor. I treat patients and this has held me back. This has made me work for other people. So in my exercise with uh, Tony Robbins, I started to say to myself, hmm, okay, when you were a very poor graduate from college and working as a heart lung technician, uh, earning uh, hourly wages, you were bootlegging Bart Simpson t-shirts and selling them to spring breakers who spent most of their money only on boots. And I made myself entertaining. I brought my dog with me and my rollerblades and I gave money to the DJs if they would uh, help me sell the t-shirts. I'd give them a percentage of things. So I figured out how to do business basically with little amounts of money. I, I double or triple my money in a couple of weeks by printing off t-shirts. Yes, very sorry, Matt Growing, for taking your uh, Bart Simpson cartoon. Uh, forgive me, uh, but of course, the statute of limitations has already passed. <laughs> um, so I, I even, when I said this to my wife, she says, yes, I've heard you make that statement before. So I've had to change my statement to myself to wind up going forward on this business. And I now have a vision of the business. I've actually been able to walk myself through the business that I did in your little uh, NLP class the other day, something that I wanted to buy. Well, I've envisioned buying this office, even though I haven't done it. I firmly put myself into the office, walked through my blueprints, et cetera, and I can see the patients that are sitting there. So um, my next step is possibly to have the coronavirus pass and to throw myself into uh, making a business legacy for my family where maybe my kid decides he wants to be an oral surgeon or some other business that he can do inside of this office, et cetera. Um, again, I have now figured out that if I learned hypnosis that I can have added value to my patients. Maybe I don't have to sedate them so heavily when I take out their teeth or when one the patient doesn't want sedation that I can still manage to take somebody that otherwise would not follow my instructions to get them kindly through a procedure just by using my voice. These are yeah. the goals that I wind up having. So that future business. Uh, five years from now, I would like to be able to have a conversation in French, Spanish, and Russian where I'm not just conversational, but I'm fluent. I uh, always say to my friend that tells me, oh, you don't need to know how to wind up having your verbs perfect. Spanish people don't speak perfect Spanish themselves. And I say, no, I'm a doctor. I am held to a different standard. Of course, I'm also a dentist, but yet at the same time, 
it's still a doctor in my mind. Again, if you limit yourself, you'll be limited. If you can see yourself to having something more, then it'll probably happen. Of course, yeah. talk to me five years from now and we'll see if I made it happen. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and we will. Um, you know, what, what I, what I, you know, if I just take all of that and sort of break down the pieces to everyone that's, that's watching, you know, we are getting these beautiful reminders about one, again, the power of language, right? Uh, the power of these identity statements. And, you know, to really understand that, you know, again, you are not your behaviors, you are not your profession, you are not your emotions, right? I mean, again, I, yes, I'm a hypnotist, right? Yes, I'm an NLP guy. You know, yes, I'm a heart math guy. You know, yes, I'm also a father. I'm also a husband. And a friend. I'm also a son. I'm a friend, you're right? Uh, I'm a motorcycle rider. I'm an archer. Like, but all of these things are still not who I am. Just That's like, funny. I noticed the Ducati model the other day and was going to ask you about it. It's, it's, it's actually a Honda CB R1000. But Hot yeah. rocket. <laughs> um, and, you know, like, and, and that's the thing is to realize, like, you know, um, for those of you that know a little bit about my story, but, you know, really quickly, you know, I went from being this super academic kid who was programming since the age of 10 um, and went into computer science where I got hit with just so much fear around writing exams and tests and there was other things that were happening and yada, yada, yada. And I ended up dropping out of school. And, you know, that was a very hard hit for me because all of my, you know, that was the one thing I was good at, right? Uh, or at least I had convinced myself, and, and that's the most important language, I had convinced myself that that was the one thing that I was good at. And so it wasn't until realizing through NLP training that the story and my self-identity was all around the one thing I did wrong, which is drop out of school. I had become blind to, hey, I'm still the same kid that has been programming, I'm still the same kid actually, you know, to your point about business, my successful first business was also in grade, was, it was in grade five, right? Where um, in grade four, there was a school newspaper, which they, for some reason, got rid of. And I remember going to the principals like, hey, what happened to the newspapers? Like, oh, no one wants to do it. And I'm like, well, I'll do it and I'll run it as a business. And she's like, well, if you're gonna run it as a business, I'm gonna charge you for photocopy. And I'm like, okay, tell me the price. So she gave me, I don't remember how much it was, but I remember I got two people to help me out, so two employees, and we took pre-orders. We ran around the school, and we took pre-orders for, I think, a quarter each, uh, and we did the math, and then we wrote this whole thing, and we created a newspaper. We paid the principal for the copies, and we all walked away with like 2 $3 each, which is a lot of money for, you know, a 9, 10 years old, right? So it's like, wait a second, you know, if I was able to do that, then, you know, what else can I do? So it's to really begin... I think for me, I am, in, I am in so much love to the potential of human experience, right? I love, you know, like every now and then if I need a boost or if I just want to relax and kick it, like I'll go on YouTube and I'll type humans are amazing. Oh, right. that sounds like a good, a good wormhole to go down. Yeah. And you'll see people writing you know, these, these mountain bikes on mountain tops and, you know, people doing like these parkour. martial arts and, oh my God, parkour. It's like, you know, it's so amazing. And, you know, you have these little kids playing the most beautiful pieces on the piano, right? There, there's just so much potential that we have. Uh, and to realize that, yes, you know, you are a doctor and you're so much more, right? And, yeah, and all fact, what hat you want to wear. <laughs> since, since the coronavirus has come and that becomes a smaller and smaller portion of my life. And the rest of it, I'd say right now, I'm more of a linguist and a reader and a pianist and a father than I am the doctor. Where exactly. in the past, I've been the doctor that does a little bit more. Oh, he paints too or, or whatnot. Yeah. I, I, I've taken up so many hobbies in my lifetime. I play landscape architect for people. Um, I, I've remodeled houses, uh, not physically, but uh, done the drawings for them or helped people suggest how to wind up. Mostly artistic, uh, linguistic sort of things. But at the same time, hobbies help your identity. And if you don't have a hobby, maybe that's one of the reasons why you're downward spiraling. You, you mm. give yourself uh, another page that you have to finish 
on the model, you have something to look forward to. Or if you have another box hiding underneath the bed that you got or one that's in the paper that you want, they're all different reasons to wind up motivating yourself or get yourself out of bed. Whether it's a new vocabulary word, a new song, anything, there are things to motivate you. Or if, if you're a charitable sort of person, one more mouth that you feed like Tony Robbins winds up, winds up doing. Whatever way it is, these are all ways to wind up getting you. You know that you're going to rinse and repeat every day. What are you going to do tomorrow that you didn't do today? And just because you didn't do it today doesn't mean that you can't start tomorrow. And once you start tomorrow, doesn't mean you can't improve on it the next day. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so if you were to sort of maybe, I, I, I don't know if you can summarize would be, would do it justice, but if you and I were to now create uh, a recipe for happiness, for contentment, which is like, you know, really, which is what we want, you know, especially during these hard times, right? Uh, when we go through these challenges, uh, I think the very first, the very first step would be to make a state decision. your goals choice. State whatever choices or goals that you have. Yes. State them. Write them down. That's number one. Okay. Number two, have uh, have a goal from that. So, you know, I want to do this, but when? When do you want to do that goal by? How soon? That sort of thing. And then, um, just like you do, if you. Uh, ever learned that checking boxes is a satisfying thing every day check a box i don't have to necessarily write it down at this point i know if i don't finish my application before i come out and see the children or by the end of the day that it hasn't been done i i can feel that pressure in fact uh the one application that i recommend duolingo has uh competition groups that are inside of it which i'm a very a competition motivated sort of person. If I'm not keeping up in the top group, then I've not done enough work for the day. So strangely, you can have peer groups that wind up helping you motivate. Like uh, we have from our uh, little group 70, you can see other people waking up in the morning and eating healthy. You can use your scale as a motivator. I want to weigh this much while I'm making this progress. Um, and for Pete's sakes, reward yourself when you make your goal. You know. Um, watch something that's uh, senseless in the foreign language as a reward versus just studying it. Uh, pick a, a serial or a TV sitcom or something and enjoy something that's mindless that's in that target language if it's language that you want. Or if you are trying to play classical music, but it's not really your favorite thing, you're just trying to play the song because it's competitive, pick a song that you love on the radio and pick that one as your one of goals too. Like make sure that you... Don't always just try to climb up the mountain just to say you climbed up the mountain. Make sure you're enjoying the view along the way too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's great, right? So, you know, the importance of being in the right state, the importance of surrounding yourself with people that are talking about and they're also working towards what you want, right? Not necessarily, you don't want to be around people that are also going in a downward spiral. <laughs> the water seeks its own level. Yeah. Um, and they say that you are only a collection of the five closest people that you have, that that's actually where you sit. Now, this has been difficult. I left from a big city to come to Florida, and I was surrounded by other lawyers, doctors, uh, uh, CEOs, uh, hedge fund owners, whatnot. And uh, I'm in Florida where the, the average person is more interested on their suntan or um, – how big the rims are on their car. So it becomes harder and harder to wind up finding that group. But well, thank God for the internet and books and books. Yes. Yeah, so if I, if books. I surround yeah. myself with the right books, then I wind up having the right inside of things. Like Tony says, read biographies because that can give you insight into people's heads. I'm not reading biographies necessarily, but recipes on science for whatever it is that I'm interested in doing. And, I find my wife is highly intelligent. My son's highly intelligent. So I've got at least two people to surround myself with. <laughs> uh, my uh, other best friend is a foot surgeon. And I have a friend that's an MBA that runs a Spanish food business. That, uh, he's the one that's fluent in Spanish that likes to tell me that I don't necessarily need to know. Even though he knows, I, I want to know too. If he didn't know and he just spoke uh, gutter Spanish, then chances are I wouldn't have that same mark to work for. 
if my wife didn't correct me at every chance she could, even though that's not the way to teach a person. It's much better to encourage than it is to correct. Encourage, maybe then correct. Don't just correct. Uh, these are all things that wind up helping you get closer and closer towards that goal. Yeah. And uh, maybe I need some more business role models. I'll find out whether or not that's true or not. But again, I still say to myself that being a doctor will allow me to wind up doing what it is that patients need. The business part of me will be the marketing myself to other uh, general dentists that will want to send the services to me so I can still function from an ethical point of view and satisfy that statement that I've had, which uh, probably comes from the fact that my dad was a businessman and I've done everything in my life not to be my dad. And by the way, sometimes a negative motivation, walking away from something is actually a, a mode to work with too. Yeah. So maybe you see yourself and that picture of yourself uh, not being happy or being angry and that clear vision, if you can stack it and make it as nasty and unpleasant as possible will be the exact recipe that propels you away from it. Yeah. Well, you know, there's that thing, you know, the, um, until the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. Cause you know, even as bad as we have it, um, change is always, you know, is unfamiliar territory. So it's always scary and it's always, um, you know, it is, it is, that's right. The change. only, the only it's inevitable painful. thing that exists is change. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think what's the thing, uh, every three years, our cells have replaced, like we are physically a different body. Yeah. Your, your skeleton takes 10 years to completely replace itself. But even the cells that are inside of that bone wind up being turned over the the scaffolding it takes a little bit longer for the minerals to be leached out of it and wind up coming so yeah 10 years ago there there was not one cell that's in my body that's still the same cell that's there today yeah and and interestingly enough too when you're talking about nutrition and getting healthy and you uh take that little red pill and you start finding about what food actually is you'll find out also that the healthier that you eat the healthier that your cells are and the healthier that your cells are, the more energy that your cell winds up being able to have. And it, it, it all winds up bringing you back to the fact that if you want to be the strongest you that you can be, the input, the learning, the food, all has to be of a high vibration and of a good purpose. Otherwise, you're probably not pushing yourself in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, one of the statements that you made really resonated with me, uh, the comment around, you know, you, <laughs> once you realize we're basically cows being fattened up to, to be slaughtered. <laughs> right. You're talking about the uh, Dr. Gundry is a, a cardiothoracic surgeon that uh, sells a lot of vitamins on the computer, but he turned me on to a lifestyle change. He eliminated some things from my diet, which were inflammatory, potatoes, corn, um, wheats, uh, anything with gluten in it, anything that's processed, the white stuff, the white rice, the white bread, et cetera, although I don't eat any bread at this point. Um, even brown rice not being so good for us because the protein coat that's on the rice is so hard for your stomach to digest that it inflames your stomach. He started me down this pathway to wind up understanding that when I was a kid, the television constantly told me to drink milk. You know, it's uh, um, it, now it's got milk, but before it used to be uh, milk does a body good. I well, remember that, yeah. It's yeah. not true that that slogan has disappeared, and now it's got milk versus it does a body good. It doesn't do a body good. It only does a child good when it's sourced from itself. So the reason that the butcher winds up feeding its cow corn is so that it fattens it up so it can slaughter it at a higher price. And when you eat that cow that's eating that corn that also just allows a country to feed its population and allow the very poor food that's high in calories to keep you with weight is exactly the reason why it is that you look around you and find that almost everybody is not succeeding on winning this diet thing. 
and I'm 53 and I weigh less than I did when I left from high school. I wear the same size pants that I did when I was in high school. And I, I've once weighed 253 pounds during my residency and I was eating the cafeteria food in the hospital that also had a McDonald's for Pete's sakes, which <laughs> the two should not go together. But yet that's what's there and that's what yeah. you eat. And yeah. that is completely not the right thing. I now look at high fructose corn syrup is a way that the, uh, the elite are trying to wind up slaughtering people. Poor people are the ones that wind up eating that mostly. And they don't really want you to live that long, apparently, because otherwise they'd never put in the food. Business and ethics have to be tied together better in my world and in the mind that I see for where we're going. Mm -hmm. because there should be no way that people can sell things to us that are harmful. And you can slap a label on it, but it doesn't matter. I see in Canada when you visit the cigarettes wound up showing the lung cancer that's on it. They don't have this in America. It's a much smaller label. But that never stopped me from smoking cigarettes when I was a smoker. Sure. It's only until I started to have the voice change inside of my head where – I couldn't possibly be a smoker. I can't even imagine that I ever did that. And again, you're right. Language is a very important thing, but also realizing that not everything that you hear is true. Make sure that you read between the lines, you know, caveat emptor, buyer beware, pay attention to what's going on. And when your eyes open, you'll realize that uh, drinking things like uh, spinach mixed with avocado and water are good and your joints won't have hurt the next day yeah i, I mean I'm, i want to read this to you I, I wrote something on a friend's page it's just uh i want to get the exact thing i wrote you know she was just commenting about the state of the world and she was talking she herself is a nutritionist right and so she was talking about the whole food thing but you know for me just what's happening on the food side is i mean it's everywhere Right. And, and this sounds a little bit, uh, maybe a bit extreme, but um, there's value. And I said, you know what? It's so true because I didn't become a hypnotist to hypnotize people, but rather to dehypnotize us from the hypnosis that is constantly being done to us. And I used your line. We are all basically cows being fattened up for eventual slaughter. I think it's really important to kind of have a, you know, a real, like, let's talk real, let's be real here and know what's going on. Giving us food that makes us sick, drugs and drinks that affect our mind, a school system that actually keeps us down, a healthcare system whose job it's only to keep us resuscitated. So just a lot. Not to cure, not to cure. Not to cure. But to keep us in that same exact state. Yeah. Uh, and, and ladies and gentlemen, remember, he is a doctor. <laughs> um, Strangely, though, as a surgeon, there's a problem that either can be fixed or needs to be cut out. Yeah, It's not something that I have to throw people on medicine or maintain them. And I'm actually hopefully never going to see a patient again after I take care of them. Um, and food causes the problem that I earn the biggest part of my living from. The fact that the food has the unrefined sugars or the, the garbage sugars means the decay shows up in people's mouths. The fact that people don't chew food that's unprocessed made our faces smaller so the wisdom teeth don't fit inside of people's head. My whole living comes about because of the same exact paradigm that we live in that has this dietary system on top of us. And if you look deep enough, you find that they did this consciously. Yeah. And so I'll continue. A healthcare system whose job it is to just keep us resuscitated. A mental health system that just labels us with diagnoses. A tax system that takes our wealth. Media that controls our thoughts. And advertisements that teach us we can't be happy and we're not enough until we buy X, Y, and Z. And truly the list goes on. Right. And so that's exactly what it is. And when we become um, really, I guess, aware, I mean, you know, it's so funny. We have so much in common, you know, and I'm on a similar journey uh, you're, that you're further along in. Um, I weigh 250 pounds. 
right? And it wasn't, I, I'm, I'm now- You need the leverage to be heavier and you quickly change it. Having the end of life looking at you <laughs> gives you that leverage. So I'd say if you're going to do one of these visualizations, say, if I live at this weight or I continue to pack it on, how's it going to be five years, 10 years? Yeah, and yeah. So That'll so, do it. So past tense, right? So now I'm around 205. Excellent. And, and when I was, you know, the, the, the funniest thing is I, it wasn't diets, um, sorry, it wasn't working out or movement, right? Um, when I quit my corporate job, Oh, sorry. Someone's calling me. Just took over. When I quit, call. yeah, when I went, uh, quit my corporate job in 2011, I think it was a, a few months in that I called one of my buddies who did something very similar uh, as me as, as in terms of starting up, you know, our own businesses. And I said, you know what I haven't had in the last three months, and it just hit me. It took three months for me to realize this. And he's like, what? I'm like just negativity <laughs> you know like the water cooler like all of that bs right? right and so within one year of changing nothing about food or um movement or anything just removing myself from that stress the cortisol i lost, I lost 25 pounds yeah that was all cortisol and then the rest was uh changing the changing the foods and the diets Right. You know, it's it's strange. I know. And eating more, again, real food as opposed to not going on a diet, but just eating more real food. I know for certain I got on the scale at college as a freshman and I weighed 205 pounds at some point. Yeah. So whenever I dieted with a traditional diet, you know, cutting this out, whatever, it wasn't the lifestyle change so much. I never got below 205 pounds. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I had the lifestyle change that I actually took off the interstitial fat, the, the bad fat that was in between everything, and then started weighing what I weighed when I was a high school student. Yeah. So you'll be amazed how quickly things wind up shifting when you do wind up realizing what the problems are. And right now, my diet is not so restrictive in my mind. I am about to try to kill my thyroid, uh, hypothyroidism that I have my last pill that I'm on. And that's going to take me saying goodbye to fish, meat, chicken, um, and uh, olive oil and uh, macadamia nuts that I eat and uh, the dark chocolate that I eat, which I all think is, you know, the junk food. <laughs> I'm going to make that stuff disappear. And just uh, be vegan, um, about 75% greens, about 25% uh, uh, fruit, but also a quarter a cup of flax seeds so that I get omega-3s is the highest type of fat that's inside of my system. Turns out that uh, if you have more omega-3 than omega-6 in your system, that it actually causes you to go into a healing pathway. And we all know if we cut ourselves that will get a scab and eventually our skin will heal. Well, our organs all work the same way too. And the medical system winds up giving me ground up pig, pig hormone, uh, almost the same cure that they had in middle evil times where if your leg hurt, you ate leg lamb, or if your liver was damaged that you wound up eating the liver of some organ. It's so archaic the way that they're trying to wind up treating the problem versus allowing our body to heal itself. And, we now know that taking things like steroids suppress our body's ability to make our own steroids. When you see thyroid medicine, which is one of the most commonly prescribed pills that are out there, being prescribed to people over and over again, but not allowing your body's pituitary access, uh, 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 adrenal access to wind up functioning, then you start saying, oh, heck, nobody's trying to cure my problem again. They're just trying to maintain me in the same static problem that I have. It's good Excellent business, you know, it's good. I mean, I say that to my clients. I'm like, I have the worst possible business model because my intention is to, if I can sort it out in a single session, I will. Right. You bring <laughs> right? your best material to the first game that you wind up playing. What are you supposed to do in your second game? Yeah. That's, Use that's, your second best? Yeah, that's exactly it. And sure, there's layers to the onions. And sometimes I do need to have multiple sessions with folks and stuff. More than one problem. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. I, I my business is the going. same as yours. A yeah. tooth is bad, I remove it. The problem's gone. That's it. I, I shouldn't have to see them again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, the, I, I, you know, and, and we can go on in this conversation too. Um, and we're going to have multiple conversations. So everyone that's watching, I mean, we, we really covered a huge scope, right, around, you know, what to do when faced with challenges, right? And it has a lot to do, I, I just think it does come down to personal choice and it's where we put our focus on, right? This could be the thing that uh, we have a choice and that's the thing, we always have a choice. There's this beautiful illustration that I keep on my phone in my favorite, so it's quick access. And it's basically two people sitting on the same bus. This bus is going the exact same direction, but it's going, uh, you know, I guess on a mountainside. So one side of the view is just this rock and dirt. And the other side of this view is like the hills and the sun and, you know, like the pastures and the greenery and it's beautiful and the birds and everything, right? Whereas the other side is just looking at the, the cliff, you know, and that's it, there's nothing else to see. And of course the person sitting on that side is miserable and I'll post it in this. And the person that's sitting on this side is, is just, you know, filled with wonder of possibility. And I, I think every day, every moment, we have a choice on which side of the bus do we want to sit on. And then we realize that once we make that choice, it's gonna, it's gonna require action, right? It's gonna require work. Um, and that's it, it's really that simple. Right, Fantastic. There we go. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you, Dale. Uh, you know, let's 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 you know leave the conversation here, and we'll pick it up. Uh, let us know what questions, what comments uh, you had, um, and you know, we'll 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 get back to this. I don't really know. This was just something spontaneous um, that I felt like is a conversation that needed to happen between the two of us and shared. Uh, with the world, again, specifically for the client and you know who you are. <laughs> really, my intention is to do this for you. And also, uh, just to everyone in general, there's so much benefit um, in this. If we just kind of watch this and kind of read between the lines and extract all the lessons and the wisdoms, there's so much that you shared with us. Uh, Dale, I appreciate, I appreciate you and I appreciate everything that you shared with us. Thank you. I, I can't imagine putting myself in front of a video camera and doing a selfie, you know, call me 53. So I appreciate you helping me with the technology and I am very happy to wind up sharing anything that I've learned and I have so much more to learn and you can wake up and imagine all the things that you have stacked in front of you as being something that's insurmountable and you can crawl underneath it and let it weigh you down or you can look at it like, wow, if I make it to the top of it, that view is going to be so spectacular. The things that I'm going to gain from getting off of it. I choose to wind up being the one that climbs versus the one that winds up being buried. Yeah, thank you. All right, everyone, have a great day. Bye.